Hello and welcome to our session, Immersive Biophilic Interventions. Um, we hope that everyone enjoys this session and we know you've given up happy hour at the hall to, to be here with us. So hopefully we'll have two happy hours here together today. Um, and everyone will come away with some better insights on how to integrate biophilic design into, into their projects. I'd like to begin by introducing our speakers. Um, on my left, we have Bill Browning, the founder of Terrapin Bright Green. He's passionate about the interaction of the built environment and natural environments. As the founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute's Green Development Service and a founding member of USGBC's Board of Directors, Bill is one of green buildings and real estate's foremost thinkers. Over the years, he served on the board of Greening America, on the Nature Conservancy's Real Estate Advisory Council, the AIA National Committee on the Environment, and the Real Estate Advisory Council for the Trust for Public Land. He is literally writing the book on biophilic design, including The Economics of Biophilia, biophilia and Mid-Century and Modern, and coming in 2020, just signed the deal for Naturally Inside. Next to me is John Swalker. He's a senior associate in Thornton Tomasetti's sustainability practice, headquartered in the New York office. He spent 12 years working to advance the integration of sustainability and green building, biophilic design, and urban planning, including three years as Mariposa's county, did I say that right? Sure. Sustainability manager. Using his diverse knowledge, he helps clients create holistic solutions for high performance and sustainable projects. He's also a contributing author for 14 Patterns of Biophilia and Tapping into Nature. On my right is Maggie Stone. She's been with the Nature Conservancy of Maine for 10 years, serving as both the development and operational teams to provide staff, donors, trustees with opportunities and tools needed to support and be effective in the Conservancy's overall success and management in the state of Maine. Recently, as a director of operations, she co-led their office renovation project, which leveraged their mission as a driver for design in their new lead CI gold well silver um, project. She helped shape the biophilic design solutions used in that project. My name is Heather Walters. I'm also with Thornton Tomasetti in their Portland, Maine office. In this role, I assist projects in their sustainability and certification goals. With 15 years of experience in sustainability, lead certification projects, most, and recently well and site uh, certification projects. I also spent three years running a 200 family farm, a CSA farm with my husband in Ohio. And I acted as sustainability coordinator for the Nature Conservancy's project, which we will discuss later today. So, let's see. Today our objectives are to understand how biophilic design impacts human health, to evaluate how varying climate zones influence patterns, to illustrate how multi-century biophilia can be integrated into architecture and communities, and to apply biophilic patterns to a conceptual drawing set. Everyone will notice on your table, there's what we're calling a kit of parts, which will be integral in the second part of our session, which is a design exercise, which will take us about 40 minutes to go through together. We're gonna to start with Bill, and Bill is going to speak to us about eco-region appropriate biophilic design. So how many folks out here are actively engaged in a project? Awesome. <laughs> um, so as you're looking at case studies and you're seeing examples, are you starting to see sort of the same thing again and again? Yeah? So one of the things in the conversation that, that helped lead to this session was a realization that biophilic design can really be an opportunity to tie people to the ecology of where they are. Why don't we use biophilic design as a way to celebrate place? So 
Let's give you a few examples. So this is a region in which I live, uh, Chesapeake Bay uh, region. I uh, live in Washington, D.C., and I grew up in southern Virginia playing in these marshes and in these loblolly forests. It's an amazing environment. Um, and you get all sorts of little things, critters, in those waterways and the mud and the, the smell of the mud, the smell of the loblolly pines is incredibly intense on a summer afternoon and it's hazy uh, with the humidity um, and you get amazing uh, bird life in these, in these marsh and forest systems. You get bald eagles nesting, you get the ospreys. Uh, during the winter you'll find buffleheads and loons and, uh, and golden eye and all these amazing other waterfowl uh, overwintering in these marshes. It's an incredible environment. And so this is a house by Karen Timberlake called Loblolly House that is an amazing celebration of what it means to be in this place. The light quality and the air, the way the air moves through this thing is incredibly fun and, and variable and really the house can open up in ways that are just extraordinary that tie you with this place. But you'll see in the design and the rhythms of this picking up uh, the patterns of the uh, Loblolly forest. You know, this amazing uh, forest. And this is a younger Loblolly forest. Uh, when these trees get older, they can be four or five feet in diameter uh, at chest height. So this is another place. This is Johnson's home territory uh, and a place that I absolutely love and, and enjoy doing projects in. Um, and so this is, I'm gonna show a project that we got to involved in in uh, 1990, 91, and 92. And so this is a region, this is the area around Santa Fe, New Mexico. So the ecosystem type is a semi-arid uh, steppe climate. Uh, the predominant trees in this system are um, pinyon and uh, Rocky Mountain juniper, both of which are amazing resinous trees that have this incredible scent. Um, and the pinyon, when you burn it, is just unbelievable. Um, the understory is sage and grasses and uh, gila flowers and, uh, um, and, other, and some cactus. Uh, amazing, amazing ecosystem with a very, very long history of human habitation. And so that serves as the inspiration for uh, this hotel, the Inn of the Anasazi, uh, in downtown Santa Fe. <clears throat> now, I have to say that this building didn't start off as this incredible biophilic exercise. The original building was a 1965 international style steel and glass box. It was actually the state penitentiary office for the state of New Mexico. And the back half was a juvenile detention center. So maybe not the, what you would expect to turn into a, a five-star hotel. And so wherever possible, they thought about the design as a celebration of Santa Fe. Not Albuquerque, not Phoenix, not Taos, literally Santa Fe. Materials were as much as possible locally sourced. Artwork were local artisans. Furniture was made uh, by local artisans. And so the check-in desk um, is based on a uh, petroglyph design. The doors, which you can see a little bit there, are based on Navajo blanket patterns. So they were celebrating um, the Anasazi, or as the I uh, hope he called them the uh, ancient ancestors. It's not none. Um, Anasazi is the um, is actually the uh, Dine name for them. Um, so this is Bandelier. This is a abandoned cliff dwelling nearby. 
here you can see artwork. And the artwork isn't just um, from Native American cultures. It's also celebrating the l deep Latino history of this place and some of the Anglo history of the place. And here you see one of those doors made by the local artisan. The stonework that the Anasazi did, particularly when you see it at Chaco, is extraordinary. Dressed masonry, cut blocks, incredibly precisely placed. Now, what's wild about it was when the Anasazi lived here, it was all covered with plaster and painted in amazing patterns. So the stonework in the building itself replicates specific time periods of the Anasazi stonework. There are different forms of that stonework. And up on the upper floor, um, they replicate something that occurs in desert areas in a number of places in the world, but particularly in New Mexico. And that is where you get these little waterfalls and little seeps forming a water feature that totally changes the thermal experience of that place. Thank you, Gail Rager. Um, and, uh, and you see these amazing um, outcroppings of fern, little maidenhair fern in the middle of this intensely hot, dry desert. And so it's a celebration of this contrast between the incredibly dry and the riparian zones. So here's another fairly dramatic um, ecosystem type, uh, the Pacific Northwest. And in particular, uh, this is a project based um, out in the islands off of uh, Seattle. This is a Methoon project uh, called Island Wood. And if you ever get a chance to visit this place, it's extraordinary. It's an environmental education center. The state of Washington has a requirement that children spend several days and overnights in an environmental experience. And it's something that's been um, a legal requirement for the education system of the state of Washington for, I think, more than 30 years now. Most of those facilities, a lot of them weren't in great shape. And so some donors came together and funded this incredible center, predominantly serving the kids, inner city kids uh, from Seattle. Um, to give them an amazing experience of nature. And this complex ties to its location, both culturally and in terms of ecologically, in extraordinary ways. This is a tree house up over a, uh, up over a uh, little canyon through the site on the island. This is the entry lobby. This is a salvaged piece of old growth timber that forms the structural uh, beam through the core of the building. Um, and then wrapping around it is a salvaged saw blade uh, with Muir's quote about a tug on one thing and you find everything's connected on it. And I absolutely love this. This was inspired by uh, Mary Coulter, People know anything about Mary Coulter, the architect? She was um, one of the first major women architects in the United States. She was practicing in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and she was working predominantly for the railroads, and she was building uh, and designing the buildings that made up the core of a number of national parks in the West. And one of my favorite buildings of hers, and one of the favorite things I did is that she did was at the Bright Angel Lodge on the rim, south rim of the Grand Canyon is this fireplace in one of the public rooms. And the fireplace is all these different bands of stone that are all the rock strata of the Grand Canyon. So here we're seeing the rock strata that make up the Olympic Mountains in this fireplace at Ironwood. So there are three examples that for us have been really inspiring and I think are terrific ways of thinking about tying to place. Johns? Well, it's so hard to follow Bill. 
first of all. <laughs> and I can say like my career has now peaked for sh sharing a stage with Bill. Um, I've looked up to him for a long time, and it's really fun to, to be here with him and everyone else. So I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about um, how biophilic design and biophilic interventions are scalable. I think uh, a lot of times we uh, think that the gesture has to be really massive to be impactful. So I'm just going to show some examples starting at sort of large scale interventions and then kind of tune it down to smaller examples that will hopefully inspire you for this exercise, but then on all the pro projects you're working on. So my background is urban design, and I can't help but do some, some more urban design thinking and, and, and not just focus on interiors. But um, So the idea is I'm going to show some examples in the exterior, and then when your exercise occurs, I want hopefully you to think about how to, how to blend the two. So the first one um, is Madison Square Park. I live in New York City, and I walk through this park every day. And what's amazing about this park is it's a porous park, meaning people walk through it just to get to where they're going. And what I, what I love about that is, you know, New York is such, a, such an urban place. It's so concrete, glass, and steel. And what this park does is it, it uh, provides a a biophilic experience by default, just because you take it to get to where you're going. And I walk through it every day, and it's very wonderful. And it's packed full of biophilic patterns. They're listed here. Um, and it's just, I, I think, you know, a lot of times when we think about parks and places of recreation, we think of those as specific destinations. And what I hope we start to think more about is parks being or vegetated spaces being a default experience and not just only a, a destination. Moving interiors now, um, this of course is the Ford Foundation, which was designed and built in the 60s, now undergoing a massive um, renovation. But um, you know, this, this idea of a wonderful light-filled vegetated space atrium is obviously not a new concept. Um, so, you know, the idea that you can look down on this vegetated space, that you walk through this vegetated space coming off, coming off of a very chaotic street in New York, you walk through this, and that experience before you get to your desk is very important, and it can calm you down and help you focus. Um, uh, I wish we could do, do more atriums like this. And then uh, this, of course, is uh, Cook Fox Terrace. They've got a lot of love at Greenbuild, which they totally deserve. Um, so they've, they are the premier uh, architecture firm who really understands how to integrate biophilic design. This is their office. They have two beautifully vegetated terraces. Um, and as you can see here, they hit on half of the biophilic patterns um, in a very small space. And they do that by... Um, you know, for example, the biomorphic forms and patterns, the chairs they select, mimics something found in nature. All of these design decisions were very intentional to maximize the amount of biophilic design in, in some very small terraces uh, in Manhattan. Um, I feel like this is probably the most quintessential image of biophilia, everyone's like, oh, just do a green wall and you're good. But um, it's, of course, more, way more nuanced than that. But I just wanted to say, like, green walls have come a long way, and they can be very, very simple now and very, um, very easy to maintain. It's no longer very complicated. It doesn't have to be a very complicated system. But just integrating um, green walls, um, you know, again, is a very strategic and powerful um, biophilic intervention, just being able to see green, especially in climate zones that have very harsh winters, where everything else is hibernating, all the leaves are gone, but being able to see a space like this uh, every day is, is really important. This is one of my favorite um, interventions. So this, this is in the Gowanus neighborhood of uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, 
And this was done by uh, a partnership with actually a developer architect and then some other uh, nonprofits, the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. And what they did was they took these, well, they're, they're, they're roll-off dumpsters, really, 3,000-gallon capacity, and they planted them, and they, straight, they placed them strategically around this part of the neighborhood. And it does several things. One, it's, it's biophilic. You, you get to see uh, uh, nature, trees, greenery in a place that's actually still pretty industrial. Um, but the thing that I really love is the, is the co-benefits of this, which is it's trying to communicate the value of bioswales and green infrastructure, saying a bioswale <coughs> has the ability to treat 3,000 gallons of rainwater runoff just through green infrastructure. So it actually does several things. And it's also temporary. So you know, this, this, doesn't, this is no longer there. But that's also interesting to think that like, a biophilic intervention doesn't necessarily have to be a permanent high cost thing. It can be something that's temporary and hopefully inspire change and hopefully you know, move to a different neighborhood. And then this is just a, a simple cork wall treatment. So literally, uh, cork bark, which is just harvested from cork trees, doesn't harm the tree, is literally uh, transformed into a, a wall treatment. And so you have the very tactile feel of a tree, but it's also very beautiful. It's, it's, it's got some, um, some, some patterns and some depth and some, some interest from seeing something like this in a space. I know it's here to sell you a product, but it's, it's sort of a wonderful gesture, and it's very simple. And so scaling down even more, um, has anyone ever heard of the artist Patrick Jacobs? He's uh, nobody. He's, he's a really wonderful uh, artist. And I actually discovered this uh, in New York City, walking down the street uh, on Fifth Avenue. There was this little like porthole that you could look in. And inside that little porthole was this beautiful landscape, this micro landscape. So what you see when you look through this, it, it feels like you are, it's like the sound of music or something. It feels like you're like on this rolling meadow and on this hill. And it's just a really wonderful surprise. And so, you know, this is something very, very small. Yes, it's an artist, and yes, he was commissioned to do it. But, like, it's, it's, it's tiny. It's a micro, it's a micro intervention and um, just sort of a lovely thing to discover and find in, in a very busy city. Of course, this is, uh, this is uh, a very, very small gesture. This is the door handle of One Bryant Park, um, one of the largest green buildings in the world, also designed by Cook Fox. And again, the intentionality is so wonderful about this. This is the handle that everyone touches when they go into this very, very high-rise building. Because, and it's important because it's a, natural, it's a natural feeling. It's not a metal. It's not a glass. It's not, it's not cold, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a warm feeling, and it's very subtle, but it's also very important. Um, and this is, of course, the material connection with nature pattern. So I just want to leave with this quote from Paulo Soleri, who I really admired a lot, and, and of course he designed Arcosanti and several other really amazing places, um, which is that, like, we need to be very strategic about how we build buildings. I know we do. We love to do glass towers, but the details matter, and those, those little decisions matter, and they can connect us to a place, like Bill was mentioning, and then they can also connect us to uh, nature. Thanks. Okay, so now comes time to start talking about the fun part of, of today's exercise. So please don't open them now in a second. But on everyone's table is a, um, is a kit of parts, is, is what we're calling them. And each kit represents um, a different ecoregion. What we'd like to do is, is there a couple tables, like little tables in the back? where only a couple people can sit and only every other one of you have a box. So perhaps you could pull together two tables in the back 
um, so you can share, share your boxes. We have four ecoregions represented, and the boxes for each is the same within, you know, that four, within those ecoregions. So I thought I'd just give you a really quick rundown of the four ecoregions that you have. The first ecoregion is the coastal pine barrens. So this region runs um, along the Atlantic coast and is uh, temperate coniferous forests. It's distinguished by pretty nutrient poor soils and, um, and pine trees and is, um, you know, there's, there's moss, it's kind of a very, um, kind of a very closed in kind of space, right? It's a very, very unique area. The next ecoregion we have represented is the California coastal area. So this is an entirely different ecoregion. It's a, um, it's a region that changes throughout the year, right? We have times when it looks like almost mm -hmm. a desert and times when it blooms. And that's kind of what, in my mind, makes this region kind of, you know, really, really a special place to be. The Bur Oak Savanna is actually an ecoregion from the Midwest. It's the area kind of in between the kind of arid, west and the coastal uh, forests in the US, right? It's just kind of in between. Mm -hmm. And the Oak Savannah is uh, traditionally a prairie um, ecoregion, and it's traditionally fire dominated. And designated um, a lot of times by these kind of signature trees, which you'll find in, in, open, in open areas. The final ecoregion that we're exploring today is the Sonoran Desert, right? So this is a massive ecoregion that takes up about half of um, Arizona into Southern California and then down into Mexico. It's a pretty significant, it's a pretty significant ecoregion um, and, is, um, and is one of the most biodiverse desert ecosystems in the world. So it's a, again, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. So the first part of our exercise is going to be exploration. So we want people to understand their ecoregions. Personally, if you've been there before, perhaps share experiences that you've had in those ecoregions with other people in your table. We have a couple tables that only have a couple people in them. Perhaps it would make, if you want to go to someone else's table so you have more people to talk to, that would be fine. Um, we want you to talk about what's special about your ecoregion. If you have any memories, right, this is a time to talk about stories and feelings that these regions bring up. And my, maybe from times you've been there, people you know have gone, or just from what you find in your, in your boxes. So in your boxes you will find, mm -hmm. for each ecoregion, a couple page description of the region. So what is this region, um, you know, ecologically, right, and geographically. You'll find a page with QR codes if you scan those with your phone, you'll go to, um, it'll bring you to YouTube videos where you can hear sounds of your region. So you can hear what your region sounds like. In each box, there are physical artifacts of your region. So one or two things to give you a tactile experience of your region. And in each box, there are also a couple essential oils. One or two oils or scents that are critical to your region. So, our, and then of course photographs. That's what we would expect to be exploring, right, our, our photographs. But by giving this wide range of, um, of senses, we're hoping that you'll be able to get kind of a wider idea of what the ecoregion is and perhaps 
some more emotional connection or maybe bring up memories mm -hmm. for the ecoregion. So the first part of the exercise, we're just going to spend a few minutes. We're saying five minutes, but you know, we'll see how it goes. And we want you to just open up the box, see what's in it, smell it, listen to it, look at it, um, and just kind of talk with each other about the region for five minutes. So you may open your boxes now. Okay, so did, did everyone have a chance to explore their boxes for a little while and talk about their regions? So, um, so a couple disclaimers I was supposed to say before I had you open the boxes. We're not ecologists. We did our best. Yeah. <laughs> they may not be the right species. Yeah. May not be quite right. We really tried. So. <laughs> Thank you. It's supposed to be representative. Um, and then also, um, throughout the exercises, we're going to be kind of walking around. Um, and what we've done is each one of us is kind of looking at a different ecoregion. So John's is kind of uh, looking at the Sonoran Desert, and uh, Bill at the Baroque Savannah, uh, Maggie uh, for the California coastal area, and um, myself for the Pine Barrens. So, as we're walking around, you know, let us know if you want to talk. And as we start the design exercise, we'll have some more, mm -hmm. some more things to say. OK. So, so now we've explored and we've talked about the region in general. The next part that we'd like to do is do a little bit of brainstorming, um, do a little bit of brainstorming exercise. And we want to think about significant elements in, in our ecoregion. Um, we want to talk about what we think would be important and we could integrate into design for our ecoregion. One of the things you have in your kit is, um, is a little card that lists kind of the 14 patterns of biophilia um, from Bill's wonderful um, document. Um, and um, so you could use that to help kind of inform the types of things that perhaps you want to brainstorm. But in general, we're going to be talking about materials, textures, patterns, colors. But we're also going to be talking about history and culture, like mm -hmm. Bill talked about. Those are also significant elements mm -hmm. that could be incorporated into a biophilic design You know, once we get to the actual design part. So this part is just about brainstorming what things we think would be neat or interesting or significant or really critical to get into a design which was trying to be biophilic specific to the region you're in. So that might be different than you might see other places. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give ourselves you know, five minutes, probably a little more, um, to talk about, um, to do this brainstorming amongst our groups. Okay. So this is the next part. And um, we didn't give you any paper. We figured you could write on the back of something or else um, everyone has their own paper to do that. But, OK. Any questions? Great. Let's go. Thanks. Talking, there we go, about our ecoregion. Um, now's the time to actually start thinking about how to integrate that into a design. Great. So I'm going to explain um, sort of all this brainstorming and all this discussion. The buildup is for this. And so you have on your table uh, a, a typical, just everyone has the same one, floor plan um, of, a, of a very basic uh, design. Um, and the idea is you're going to work with your table. And uh, you have an elevation and a, a large elevation, just so you can kind of get the scale of what the building should look and feel like. It doesn't have to be, we're not trying to throw out crazy design here, but um, just so you can get a sense. Um, here's some, oh, it's a little cut off. No, it's good. OK, so 40 employees, 
Um, 9,000 square foot office is the program, is the typology in the program. The client is ecologically minded. They're a 501c3. So the, the question is, what are the biophilic design interventions that you can include in this, in this building that connects you to your ecoregion? Okay? Does that make sense? Is that, is that clear? I'm going to show you an example. So um, you, have, you have freedom to do whatever you want to do with this. You can move walls. You can um, redesign the space if you want to. Um, you can redesign the window to wall ratio if you want to. Um, it's really kind of your whatever you want to do. So here's just like a quick, we just sketch this like really quick, an example of like what you're going to show on the plan. So the idea is, actually let me see if I have a little pointer, I do. So we just splashed up a few things um, to give you an example. So, so let's start here. So this is the lunch break room. And we said, what if you did worm compost here? And there's an olfaction element to that, good or bad. Uh, and then there's a connection with natural systems with this intervention. That's kind of a fun one, get kind of a gimme. Uh, and then we said, well, what if you did a cork, cork bark wall here in the large conference room? It's tactile, material connection with nature is the pattern. What if you did some oil diffusers here in the, in the restrooms? Uh, what if you changed um, the carpet tiles to mimic something found in nature, whether it changes colors or something like that to mimic that? Uh, maybe you did a little water feature here in the middle. Uh, we also changed the lines, the, this, this wall here, we changed it, it used to be straight, now we're saying it's going to be curved. Uh, we did some elevated seating, so you're up high, so you kind of have the, the prospect refuge condition there, and you have the windows uh, behind you, so you have sort of um, access to natural daylight. And then we can even, you can even move rooms if you want. If you want to pull rooms from a window and place it into the space, that's also possible. So quick snapshot, the idea is you work with your table to design in biophilic interventions in the space based on your ecoregion. Questions about the task? Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we will cycle through these occasionally so you can kind of remember what the brief is and, right, yeah. Can you locate it in the region where you'd like to? <clears throat> site, the exterior. Your site with, is within your eco region. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. And um, if anyone needs trace paper, we have a couple, we have a little bit. <laughs> okay, everyone. So, we hope everyone had a really good time um, exploring their region. What we would like to do now, um, we have a lot of tables, a lot of groups, so we've kind of just picked one group from each eco-region just for, you know, so we're not here all night, right, uh, to, talk about, to talk about their region. So I'm going to hand the microphone to uh, the group and we would like each one of them to spend maybe, you know, four or five minutes and just talk about the few, two or three, one, two, three, most critical interventions that they think are most important for their ecoregion. So I'll start with California. <laughs> All right, so our ecoregion was the California coastal sage chaparral. And um, there were six things that we wanted to focus on. One was uh, textures, 
uh, smell of sage, and all of us literally applied the sage essence on our, <laughs> on our wrist to take the smell along with us. Uh, seasonal transitions, because you have more of the mountains, and then you have, it gets dry, and then you see plants sprouting. So then the seasonal transitions to be able to uh, see that in the space as well. Um, there's also uh, the burning of the wood, so, so we wanted to represent that. We actually put a fireplace in our space, some place to burn, and, um, and kind of blur the insides and the outsides, so kind of just open up the space and get more of the outside into the building. Uh, some, do we have to go with some design ideas, maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh, so we have a plan. We have some detailed sections, but a few things that we did was to... We noticed that there was, we could achieve cross ventilation. There's windows on both sides. So what we did is use that to get our sense of sage and the smell. So we actually planted, we have a central courtyard that we punctured, punched into the space to get light in. And we plant sage plants in there. And then as you have air moving through from one cross ventilating, you could smell the sage in the space. That was one design intervention. Another one was to have screens to allow for that. In the conference rooms, we wanted to in get, the, get the sounds of the birds, so we probably have some nature sounds playing in there during, in the lunch or break rooms. Uh, we could also use those blank walls which have no windows and have a mural to mimic that eco-region, so just have, get a local artist and paint a mural in there. We have textured carpeting. Um, anything else that I can think of? <laughs> right, and we also broke down the reception table a little. It was a little rigid, and what we noticed about the California landscape, it's very organic. So we broke it down, and we took the striation of the rock formation and made a pattern on the reception table, and we carried that back to that main wall, creating a green wall at the main entrance to give you a sense of arrival, and the green wall would somehow reflect this same, you know, very striking image of that... Um, that blooming season during in California. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. For the next, we'll go to the Pine Barrens, I guess, because they're all the way over here. So I'll walk over here. So they're all the way on the coast. They're all the way on the eastern coast. So you know you have to walk all the way a long way from California. Thanks. I'm going to let my colleagues here do the intro. Uh, we basically, just uh, to let you know, as a group, we decided to open up the windows around the perimeter, let the light and air of the natural system come in, and have some interior features. So some of the um, textures and colors and, and design features we wanted to bring in were the different earth shades um, found in the forest, brown, uh, green and earth colors. Um, we love the texture of pine needles and pine cones, um, and we wanted to bring the feel of moisture um, from the forest into the space. Um, and one of the other big textural components um, was the light and the way the light would come, be blocked by the canopy, but find its way through the open spaces, kind of like that image, right? That's kind of the inspiration. Um, so we'll talk about the specific interventions. Yeah, so uh, I spent most of the budget on breaking the mold of this space to kind of <laughs> mimic what a pine cone does when uh, they're, during fires it'll close up uh, to protect its seeds and then open up uh, when the danger has subsided. So I just pretty much wanted to do that with large panels uh, kind of opening and closing based on the weather as well as creating a passive cooling system. Um, so that's our... And for the interior, we um, were looking at several of the patterns of biophilic design. And um, for instance, in the center, we saw the open area with all the structural columns as replicating the complexity and order of a forest. And that maybe this was an open teeming area that had some protective covering over it. And that covering might be something that represents dynamic and diffuse light by having acoustic elements that vertically um, come from the ceiling 
intervened with um, solar light tubes, so there's a dappling of natural light. Thanks so much. That's really exciting. So now we go over to the Sonoran Desert, which is on the West Coast. So let me go over to the West Coast. Um, so we looked at the Sonora Desert and um, we looked at what was in the box, we talked about our experiences and what really drew to us to the space was that we wanted to open everything up first of all, we didn't like any walls, we wanted to make it as fluid and open as possible. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the windows were operable so that we can see outside, we have the connection to the exterior, but we also get that sort of um, breeze and maybe a morning mist or and, you know, some of that inside. Um, all the um, items inside would be sort of in an organic shape. Um, some of the bigger ideas that we had were um, we have this sort of strata wall that we were thinking. Um, that would have um, lighting on it uh, that would so sort of all this circadian rhythm. Um, and in the center of the space, you see this sort of big blob that would be a space where people can come, where they can retreat, relax, um, and also reconnect with other uh, people or colleagues uh, who work there. Um, and then in terms of conference rooms, we thought this is where we can bring in some culture. Um, so instead of calling a conference room, conference room one, two, or three, we wanted to sort of give each one its space, its identity. Um, and we thought the best way to do that is if we, let's say, connect it back to the culture of this place and say, conference room, that's a Navajo room or a Hopi room. I hope I'm saying the right names here, so excuse me. <laughs> um, and they, they would also display the art, and it could be sort of rotating art, right? So that just gets uh, changed out as... Um, um, uh, new things come in. Did I miss anything? Um, oh, and then we talked about the sound. Sorry, that was another big sort of design um, aspiration for us was when you open the windows and let's say if it rains, um, that you can hear that rain and maybe we have some features on the exterior wall or on the roof that sort of give that softness of the rain and we can sort of um, direct it in a way that it doesn't sound as harsh but sort of soft and and um, relaxing. Thanks. And so we're missing the, so now I have to go to the Midwest. So that's over here. To the uh, Burr Oak Savannah. Yeah, so uh, our group started by examining everything that was in the box. And one of the things that stuck out to all of us was the patterns on the prairie grass that uh, runs over these, these flat plains uh, in this ecosystem. And the other thing that stuck out to us uh, as a key design element was was the, the long spans of... of flat rolling or rolling hills with with elements of, of verticality uh, spurred in uh, intermittently and so when we brought that into into the the floor plans and, and elevations uh, the the number one consideration was was making sure that you would have prospect over the entirety of the office um, no matter where you were so so walls became transparent um, and and Rooms got moved around in order to create a very open floor plan uh, that that would allow for that prospect to to occur. Um, skylights were uh, oh put in, I guess. Uh, yeah, skylights were put in to to help with the uh, introduction of natural systems, uh, the circadian rhythms of of having the the natural daylight uh, over the course of of the workday, and then, um, oh, and including a, a visual connection with nature, so the carpet becomes um, resembling, or the carpet uh, resembles the color scheme of, of the ecosystem, a lot of browns and, and greens and, and uh, 
yellows, and then uh, a, an abstracted version of, of the pattern found in these prairie grasses uh, gets painted on, on one of the walls in, in that large open office space. Thanks so much. Okay, so now for the big reveal. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. It was my actual office, that dud of a space. Okay. Okay, so I turned that off. <laughs> because I'm sure it's bad if you sounded two things at a time. Okay. So now uh, Maggie and I want to talk to you about the Nature Conservancy of Maine's um, office. So we're a global organization. Our mission is to conserve the lakes and lands and waters on which all life depends, with the goal of having people preserve, conserve lands not only for nature's sake, but also for what it provides to people themselves. Um, <clears throat> we've been in this space in an old mill on the fourth floor in Brunswick, Maine um, for 30 years. We have done nothing to it. Um, we've slowly taken over spaces and so there was no fluidity, no connection. It was very dark with very tall cubicles um, and as you could see, offices lining the windowed walls. Um, yeah. So um, we started the project with a goal finding exercise to try to figure out what the Nature Conservancy's goals were. And we explored a variety of rating systems from LEED all the way to Living Building um, Challenge. And we ended up deciding that the most appropriate rating systems for the project was LEED and also WELL, because they have a significant focus on occupant health. At the end of the day, the project um, earned a LEED CI Gold rating and a WELL Silver rating the first well project in northern New England. So, yay! <laughs> so, um, so this is the plan you were given, and this is what we did. So, um, the kind of some of the really significant design elements are this wandering wall, which you'll see many other times in our in our photographs. And, and it's kind of interesting because there's a sense of mystery and prospect, right? Because we come in to this front door and on the left side is just a straight wall that we use as a gallery space for rotating local artists. And then we follow this curved wall around. And it's not till you get up to that middle where it says two, the space kind of opens up and the receptionist is on the other side of that space. So you're halfway into the space before you're greeted. So there's a sense of exploration and mystery involved. The other really interesting thing that we, that we did that you won't see elsewhere um, as clearly as here is we, is as you saw in the elevation, as you saw in the elevations, um, there's a lot of ceiling height in this space, 16 to uh, 18 foot ceiling, depending on if you're in the middle or the side. So we were able to create a little mezzanine tucked above these spaces here. And you'll see um, why that became really special um, in a minute. Uh, but biophilic design was essential in the design of this project. So I may be biased, but I think Maine is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, we have large areas of really tall, dark, old growth forests that block the light from getting to the ground below. Um, and then we have places like this, which is the Saco Heath, which boasts a, a mile-long boardwalk made of recycled materials, and in the course of the day can go from deep green to yellow to an almost like silvery gray as the light hits it. Click. Sorry, we should be sharing here. Um, so we tried to mimic the same things in this space. So the carpet has a texture like a grass or a peat and um, makes its way slowly from the dark on one side to a brightness on the other side. Um, we had, we had, took away all of the offices from the exterior walls, so we let in a lot more light, so the whole space became bright and it affected so much. It just, it's inspirational. Um, and we added, not quite yet, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so we, yeah, we should share this. <clears throat> um, we, we also added lights that adjust with the daylight 
so um, with full daylight spectrum. So not only does it tell you that you're awake just by the virtue of the quality of the light, but it also, when it's really bright coming in from outside, the lights will turn off so that it feels the appropriate amount of lightness. Um, Maine is also a place of great extremes in our colors. Um, the ocean is an almost violent deep blue all the time and really cold year round. Um, and we have these like dark, dark forests, but then there'll be these spots where you'll see, you'll come upon a, a, a field of, or not a field, a forest of like birch trees, and it's suddenly less like bright white and yellow. Um, so we tried to integrate as much of that color as we could. Um, this carpet here is an interface carpet, the net effect, and it is um, made from recycled sea nets. And so not only did that connect with our work with the local fishermen in the Gulf of Maine, but it also looks like the waves crashing against the shore. Um, and in this case, crashing against the yellow birch of the wandering wall. So it's this stark contrast of like the violent waves against this brightness. Um, all of the colors that we used were colors that you would find in nature. So there's the still pond of the kitchen behind. And then below is the fields that I just showed you um, with little pepperings of gr other green growing things and um, tiny elements like a cork board that is actually a berry color to show all the fresh berries you can find. Maine is a state of forests. Over 80% of the state is forested. There are 2,000 trees in Maine over five inches in diameter for every person in the state. 3.2 billion trees in a state of 1.3 million people. Okay. There are a lot of trees in Maine. So, so um, the Nature Conservancy manages 1.7 million acres of land in Maine, much of that FSC certified forests. So we were able to harvest um, yellow birch for the wandering wall from the Nature Conservancy's own FSC certified forest, and maple for the flooring in the raised flooring area up here in the steps and conference room, again, from, from their own forest. So we were able to utilize their own wood in the space and utilize it in this way where this wandering wall starts off as solid as, an, as, as it progresses through the space, it becomes more transparent and starts to open up to kind of let light through it. Maine is also not a state of straight lines. Between our rivers, our mountains, our lakes, and our meandering coastline, there's a saying in Maine, you can't get there from here. <laughs> and if you've ever visited Maine, you know that's true because it takes forever to drive absolutely anywhere. And it's because the state itself resists straight lines. And we've mentioned this wandering wall a few times. It is the central organizing um, element of the space. And it was designed to follow, reflect the flow of the river down below. This building is sited kind of in the Lower Peninsula on the crook of a river. And so the wall reflects the river below. Um. When you're having a bad day in Maine, you just climb a mountain. Um, they're everywhere. They could be like, you know, 300 feet, doesn't matter. You just climb it. You can climb it in a dress. You can do anything. So I do that a lot. Um, one of the main reasons why we decided to stay in this fourth floor old mill building is because of the beautiful view. So we looked over the river, and previously it was just, it was blocked to most people. So unless you were in one of those private offices, which I was not, or in one of the cubicles that lined the other one, which of course had the spine going the wrong way, so you couldn't see it. Um, you didn't get to experience the eagles and the sturgeon and all of those things that when you see are just inspirational and remind you of why you work for the Nature Conservancy. So we broke that down. As I said, we took all of the offices away from the windows and we gave as many sort of nooks and crannies for this view as possible. Um, our conference rooms, which are tucked under the mezzanine or against the walls, are away, are away from the walls a little bit, are all glass so that it blurs the line between inside and out. And so you can be in a conference room and having a beautiful view, and directly outside of you there can be someone you know, reading or thinking or doing whatever people need to do. Um, we made as much space as possible so that all of the common areas are now along the windows, and there's no one who is up against the windows hogging that view for themselves. 
Um, we also have, when you're, when you're out and about, there's, you look up, there's a canopy of trees or you know, the ocean above you because you're swimming in it, like me if you're an insane person, <laughs> swims all year. <clears throat> um, so we tried to integrate as much of that into our office as possible. Um, the conference room has these sound clouds that are supposed to mimic the canopy of the trees. Um, they, you can also see them in the kitchen, and so when you're in the mezzanine looking down on the kitchen, they look like lily pads, so it sort of changes as you move about the space. Um, we also have the, um, the, the old columns that are supporting the roof of this old, really old mill building remind you of the tall old growth forests, and we tried to emphasize those as much as possible, um, not trying to hide them like a lot of the architects would try to we're trying to like encase them in some sort of walls and we're like, no, we want those as much as possible. So we really tried to play on those motifs. So Maine has a history of exploitation of our natural resources. Much of the state um, was clear cut historically and the rivers were used as highways to get logs from as far as New Hampshire out to the water to be shipped off um, for warships historically and later for other uses, timber and paper. Um, many of these logs sunk. The Penobscot River is a significant project for the Nature Conservancy. It's one of their largest projects. In Cooperation with the Penobscot Indians and local utilities, they removed dams up and down the river, and over two million additional fish are now able to swim up that river. That same river was used as one of these highways for logs, and these pieces of wood that hold up the um, countertop in the kitchen were salvaged from the Penobscot River, their old growth. Um, their old growth, and the counter itself also was made from that, from that same wood. So what we've done, we feel, is we've taken a piece of history, which was of exploitation, and now it's a history, it's a um, heritage of protection and management, um, and the Nature Conservancy's forests are used, but they're managed in a responsible way for the environment and for the economy of Maine. The project is, as we've said, a historic mill building. It dates from the 1820s. We say the 1860s-ish, depending on the part of the building, but there is actually a little corner that dates all the way back to the 1600s. So as we've said, we did try to keep as much of that heritage as, as we could. We have existing brick walls, columns, everything that we thought was appropriate to maintain, we uh, maintain visually. Maine is a really, you can tell we love Maine. Maine's a really special place. Um, you find things like this around every corner almost. And actually there's bald eagles nesting right outside of the Nature Conservancy's office. But it's not unusual to be paddling down a river and to come around and find a bald eagle's nest. These types of spaces are not unusual. We wanted to have a little bit of that feeling and that was one of the drivers of the mezzanine is this nest area that kind of sits above and lets people have that view and look out over the rest of the space. So one of my favorite spots is in the Debs Canigs Lakes Wilderness, which means carrying place. And um, you follow a trail, not unlike this, though this is not that actual trail, um, up these steps that had to be man-made because otherwise they were just not travelable. Um, and then you get to this cave and you crawl down or climb down into this magical little space and it's really narrow and you're a little nervous because you're like, what am I actually doing right now? And then you get to the bottom and it opens up into this beautiful, huge ice cave that looks all blue and white and just, it's just a magical space. So there's magic in these spaces where you don't really know what you're getting into, and, but it's worth the risk. So we tried to imitate that in our space with the mezzanine um, especially 
And so you climb up these stairs, and they're really narrow, and they wrap around the wall. Um, and then you get to the top, and it opens up, and it's all of these fall colors up there, whereas everything else is these you know, rich, rich greens and blues. And so you get up there, and it's like the rust of a main autumn. And it just sort of feels like you're in a special spot. Um, likewise, as Heather was explaining, when you come in, the, you sort of walk up this pathway for a long time before you're actually in the office. So the wall brings you in and around before it opens up, and then you stand overlooking the entire rest of the office. So we tried to mimic that magic. And one of my colleagues works on the far, far side of the office, and there's another little secret employee door that we have. And every day, he still walks in and puts his hand along that wall and runs it up just to feel the magic of that space. So, and it's been you know, two years now, almost, since we've been in there. <clears throat> um, we also know that changing your location can change your perspective, so it's always good to be able to move around. Before, there were no places to move around in our office. You were either at your cubicle or your office, or you were in a kitchen that was smaller than this stage. Um, and so one of the main things we wanted to do was give people different and new ways to work. Um, so we have, not only did we add five extra meeting rooms by consolidating all of the center, all of the um, workstations into the center of the office, but we also were able to add all of these little secret places. So, you know, there's, you can sit underneath the mezzanine or on top of the mezzanine, and there's touchdown spaces to sort of break up the way you work. And then the four private offices that we have, which are all for confidentiality reasons, whenever anyone's not there, we have big signs that say open, so you can go in and use those spaces as well. Um, we wanted a space that would represent who we are as an organization and could show that we are able to be innovative thinkers who can handle the world's most pressing conservation issues with science and exploration, and um, we think it does. So in our lobby, we have this giant updatable map that showcases not only the breadth of the main wilderness um, with all of that green, and, but also shows all of the work that we've done so far. Mm. And uh, there's a little laser pointer below, and a, there's now a coffee table blocking part of the Gulf of Maine. It's okay. <laughs> um, and so we have a, a laser pointer, and so almost everyone who comes in is like, I've been there. How's the, how high have you gone? And so it's a really cool space. Um, and we think that not only does this show who we are and where we're going and what we have left to do, but also you can see in the carpet there's the Gulf of Maine, and in the wandering wall there's the St. John Forest, and in the kitchen, there's the Penobscot River. So it really tells the story of, of all of the work that we've done in all of our partnerships. So. so thank you very much for listening to our little story. So um, we'd like to take um, a little bit of time and answer any questions that anyone might have. We have a, have a microphone that we can Bring around. Also, open invitation to come visit. Just email me first so I know you're coming. One's probably good. OK, questions? Um, where did you source your light fixtures throughout the space so that they complied with the well light concept? The, uh, I don't know about the, uh, the casings for it, but the lights themselves are Lighting Science Group. And um, they, they're the people who created lights for NASA um, initially. And then, um, yeah, and then they did lights for the Chilean miners just to make sure that they could tell the difference between day and night. So um, but they're really awesome lights. I have since outfitted my entire house in them, too. So I'm, I've, I'm a real convert. I love them. And um, also, it's, it's important to know technically that, um, that we met the light uh, precondition with the addition of task lights. With the addition of task lights, you're allowed to use task lights to meet the, yeah. So, so we use task lights too, so as a combination. So I've got a little bit more of a philosophical question, but man, beautiful project, and I want to come to Maine. Chicago's not bad, but <laughs> we don't have 
however many trees per person. Um, so, I mean, clearly what you did made a wonderful place to be. And as I go in my practice trying to integrate biophilic design, but I think about it from an ancestral standpoint of us hundreds of thousands of years living outdoors, and mm -hmm. now we live all the time indoors. Mm -hmm. The question I'm asking myself is, we do things that are better, but how much is enough, really, for psychological health and stress and, uh, you, you know, I mean, are we ever going to get to a point where we can quantify that or we can have a sense of, yeah, that's not just good enough, but really good? Bill? Um, so the neuroscience is getting better and better. Uh, but we know that even just seeing a picture of nature will lower blood pressure and heart rate. If you look at that picture of nature for 40 seconds, your brain will shift into what's called attention restoration mode, which means the prefrontal cortex quiets down. And when you come back on task, your cognitive function is greatly improved. Um, and so that's just seeing a picture of nature. Um, we're seeing more and more stuff emerge out of neuroscience about different reactions in the brain and sort of the pathways that occurs. Obviously, <clears throat> getting out in nature is the best. Um, the, one of the reasons why we gave you sense and textures and all of that is what we're also learning is that the impacts are greater if I can experience those with more than just visual. Um, there are different neural pathways. Um, so uh, one of the latest pieces of science that was kind of fun and interesting was uh, an experiment in, uh, with mice um, exposing them to uh, lanolin, which is the predominant uh, chemical component of lavender. And what they found was it triggers the same neural pathways as Valium. So it literally reduces anxiety. Um, not if you eat it, not if you inject it in bloodstream, only as uh, rece scent receptors uh, and that neural pathway. So different thing, you know, so texture, uh, the thermal variability, light variability, all of that stuff is really, really crucial is thinking about how do we replicate indoor as much as possible um, that variability in the sensory stimulus that you get outdoors. But ultimately, I want you to get outdoors too. Hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've also noticed that I think that being in a space that speaks nature has given us more permission to go outside. So we have a lot more of our meetings as walking meetings. It sort of gave us a reboot in a lot of ways. And I mean, we're all, I mean, we're in the Nature Conservancy. We all sort of live and breathe nature all the time. But <clears throat> it's amazing how much, you know, being indoors and just with head down, you don't, you don't look up. So even just implementing little tiny elements like the colors or textures, um, things that anybody can do on any budget um, are you know, just ways to sort of reawaken you a little bit. Yeah, and it's important to note this was not a high budget project. Yeah. At all. So. I mean, it was to us, but. <laughs> yeah, it was to you, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for staying with us to the end. <laughs>